Joining us now is Nagar Mortazavi, who is a diplomatic correspondent for The Independent. I actually learned about you by watching Democracy Now! And I'm grateful that you took the time to join us today. Thank you, Nagar. My pleasure, thanks for having me. So I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on how Donald Trump handled his speech today because there was a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety that the United States would respond to Iran's missile attacks against US bases with more aggression. But it seems like he's backing down, at least that's my read of it. But I wanted to get your take. I agree with you. It seems like we won't see an escalation today or an imminent war, at least for now. Because of the way I believe the retaliation was designed by Iran, it seems like they made it precisely in a way or even tipped off Iraqi forces to make sure there will be no casualties. And we see that there are no casualties, American or others, um, but then basically uh, use this as a warning or a deterrence. Um, to show the U.S., as the Iranians have been saying, and now uh, Iranian experts are also telling me that they are capable and willing to attack American bases from Iranian soil publicly. They're not going to hide behind, hide behind other forces or proxies. Um, they're going to do this uh, and stand behind it. Um, and I think the way it was designed with no casualty, basically the red line that uh, President Trump has um, draw he drew over the summer as well. Um, with that no casualty, they offered an exit ramp out of this uh, situation, which everyone was um, really worried that might escalate. And they offered this exit ramp and President Trump took it basically. Uh, without that casualty, it seemed like it was a one-off, an attack for an attack, but not blood for blood. Mm -hmm. uh, but also Iranians see this as a deterrence. So Ayatollah Khamenei said something about how, look, this is retaliation, but this isn't nearly enough. Uh, he somewhat implied that there's more coming. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that because oftentimes, you know, you hear a lot of tough talk in order to deter any other or further aggression. Uh, but there's a lot of frustration and anger about US provocation. It's not as though what happened to Soleimani was the only provocation. This has been happening under the Trump administration from the moment he pulled out of that Iran nuclear deal. So what are your thoughts about further retaliation from Iran? So we have to remember this proxy war between Iran and the US has been ongoing and that is not going to stop. Mm -hmm. That is going to continue. We don't, this is not a ceasefire to that. But the, the retaliation for targeting Bassem Soleimani, which Iranians really saw or portrayed as an act of war, a massive aggression uh, that they were shocked. Nobody expected that to actually happen by the US basically assassinating a foreign official um, on another country's soil. It came as a big surprise and the Iranian hardliners, the Supreme Leader himself had been vowing severe retaliation for that. At the same time, there is this sense among, uh, among Iran experts, at least that I'm talking about, that if Iran didn't respond at all to the, in, in like this big show of retaliation, something flashy they can play, um, on TV over and over again. If they didn't do this deterrence, then it would mean that attacking them, this type of major aggression will have no cost. So there's obviously a camp here in Washington that thinks attacking Iran, even invading Iran or bombing Iran is not going to have any cost because the US um, military is so big and mighty. And it seems like the Iranians wanted to show uh, that the cost of that is going to be severe. And like I said, they're willing and capable Maybe they're not capable of hitting the White House or anyone here in Washington, of course, but at least they're capable and willing uh, to attack U.S. bases in the region. But then at the same time, not willing to start a full-on classic war with the U.S. That's why they offered the exit ramp that I was talking about. So I'm glad we talked about what's happening currently, but it's also important to understand how the United States got to this situation with Iran in the first place. 
I feel as though the way the media has covered US Iranian relations has been incredibly shallow and, and surface level. Because in order to really understand it, you need to look into the history of US Iranian relations. And so you had a great tweet that I, I wanted to draw a little attention to. You wrote, every American has heard of the hostage crisis in Iran. But most have never heard that a few years later, our Navy killed 290 Iranian civilians, including 66 children. Both sides have a long list of grievances against each other. This fight is not one sided. And of course, there was a US orchestrated coup in, I believe, 1953 that overthrew the democratically elected prime minister of Iran. And so I was hoping that you could maybe talk a little bit about why Iran feels such hostility toward the United States in the first place. Sure, so the anti-American sentiment in Iran didn't come out of void or it's not because Iranians are Muslims or they hate the West or freedom or anything like that. You, like you said, we have to go back and look at at least recent history. So the US orchestrated uh, coup against Iran was just in the 1950s, less than, just over less than a century ago. And that has that's a vivid memory in the Iranian psyche. Basically, the understanding is that there is this uh, other country that's powerful, mighty co uh, country that can always undermine our governance, our um, regimes, or a democratically elected official. At the same time, um, there has been this list of grievances that I'm talking about, the uh, civilian airline, um, a major one of them that is also something that many Iranians still uh, see as an unresolved problem with the US, but many Americans don't even know about it. I talked to some of my friends and colleagues and some of them have actually never heard about it. Um, whereas uh, an event, an agreement on the US side, something like the hostage crisis, attacks by Iranian proxies, Iranian um, revolutionary guards having US blood on their hand, all of that is something that's over and over repeated in the US. And specifically with this administration, it seems like officials are trying to portray this as a completely one-sided 40-year war um, of escalation. I think it was Secretary Esper saying it's been Iran who's been escalating and escalating against the United States um, in the past 40 years. And that's just not, not how it's played out. So I wanna look to the future and the possibility of actual peace uh, among the United States and Iran and other, other Middle Eastern countries. And so, I know in my mind who the best leader in the United States would be in order to handle these types of foreign policy issues. I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Now, ideally, after 2020, Donald Trump would not be the leader of one of the most powerful countries in the world. But out of the Democratic candidates, out of the options that we have available, based on your read and your expertise, who do you believe would handle the situation with Iran appropriately to de-escalate the situation? Well, I'm not going to endorse any candidates or tell people how to vote. But out of all the Democratic candidates, I think the foreign policy agenda in general and specifically the Iran file of the Bernie Sanders team has been the most extensive and the most informed. Bernie Sanders is the only person who talks about the 1953 coup. Bernie Sanders is the only person who talks about Iran's prime minister Mossadegh. Bernie Sanders is the only one who talks about how this form of escalation uh, is just not going to lead anywhere. He's someone who opposed uh, the invasion of Iraq and now uh, makes clear comparisons to Iran. Of course, others like Elizabeth Warren um, and other progressives have had similar, have made um, a similar good comments. But I think as far as the uh, extent of it and the grasp and the understanding of the foreign policy, it's been uh, the camp of Bernie Sanders that's been most consistent mm -hmm. um, and not afraid of taking a position that sometimes is not necessarily very popular. Yep, well, that's that's certainly something Bernie Sanders uh, is known for throughout his uh, political career. Uh, Nagar, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. I, I appreciate your expertise, and I hope you'll come back uh, soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. So really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get 
playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.